What is up, everybody? This is Marshall Lee of DonkeyJawProjects.com, and today we're going to talk about penciling comics, getting getting it ready for inks, for finishing, um, and everything that that goes along with that, uh, especially digitally. But I think some of these things we're talking about will help you also um, with traditional pencils if you're more into that. Uh, and today to talk about that, we have Mr. Russ Leach. Once again, the comic book black belt. How are you doing, man? Hi there, fine, thanks. Feeling a bit better now. A uh, bit of a deprivation in my voice, but hopefully I'll be able to see the the, the uh, video through. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. It sounds good so far. <clears> so <throat> I think we'll Getting be good. Um, so uh, just so everybody knows, where can people find you, Russ? Uh, yeah, you can find me at russleach.com, comicbookblackbelt.com, or onlydeathcansaveus.com. And uh, you can find links there for my Instagram and, and Facebook, Twitter accounts, and uh, also sign up to the email uh, list as well, so I can keep you up to date with what's going on. Awesome. And just so you guys know, we're going to do a little bit of a live demonstration here. Um, and and so at the end, we will you know, take some questions and stuff if you guys have anything specifically about penciling. Um, so let us get into the kind of live feed and first of all i just wanted to talk about um kind of the role of a of a penciler in comics and and i know i know you're probably going to cite the good old um how to draw comics the marvel way um there's so much good stuff in that i mean definitely everybody check out the videos on youtube or the actual you know book uh of that because i think uh a lot of what I've learned, and I'm sure a lot of what Russ has learned, has come from that and other sources as well. But uh, Russ, what what is uh, what do you see as like the role of a penciler um, in comics? With your uh, experience, primarily the sto you're the visual storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I actually, funny enough, made a video myself today, which spoke a little bit uh, to this, and it's uh, your connection with the uh, with the writer. So if you're not the writer, if you're the penciler and you work with a writer, um, uh, then it's it's your job to interpret that script from the writer, to have a connection to the writer. You understand what the writer is trying to uh, get over. If it's your own creation, then obviously you've you've kind of uh, shortcut that already because it's already in your mind, um, and it's it's your job to make the story flow. So it's not about drawing pretty pictures. It's about telling stories. It's primarily a visual medium. It's a storytelling uh, device. A comic is a, a device to, to tell a story. And to get that story across properly, the penciler must not just make it uh, convincing, as in drag you into the world. So you can extend limbs and do all kinds of cheats. It's not about photorealism, but it is about convincing the reader visually so that they're they're pulled into the world and pulled along with the story, um, and what happens is you you then have a a combination of wanting to read the script and the story and pushing you forward, and then the visual storytelling, like pushing you along with it. It's, it goes completely in tandem. It's definitely a a fifty fifty split between writing and, and art, and uh, it's it it's about the story. That's the primary function of the penciler to tell the story, uh, but also to convince the reader. And that's where um, techniques come into play, like, you know, how, how well you draw as far as a convincing anatomy or scene depiction. Um, so that even though you might be stretching things or cheating, it's still, you know, convincing the reader that they're in that world. Mm. Yeah, that's well said. That's, that's very true. And I like that you <clears throat> the, um, kind of the the collaborative a aspect and and traditionally i mean you can do it a lot of different ways but traditionally uh comics has been a collaborative medium and um so you know the draw the artist all, all the people involved kind of have a role in the writing um and you know the storytelling and stuff like that so so i'm glad you i'm glad you brought that in so it looks like you got a few examples of um mm -hmm. kind of the you know how it goes from drawing to inking um yeah I, i'm curious uh 
you know, when you're thinking, so you're thinking about the storytelling, but you're also thinking about who's coming next after you, whether it's yourself or somebody else. Um, so you're preparing, the pencils are preparing for um, finishes and, and inks. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, I think there's there's multiple ways you can approach this. Um, I think it makes a difference if you're inking yourself. That, that That's a major influence on how you pencil if you look at the way guys used to uh artists used to pencil back in the day um especially people like john boosmer you'd see some very very loose um layouts that then a very proficient inker would go over the top of and they got to a point again this is actually something i mentioned in, in my video earlier today you, you get a relationship going where you trust the other person so um in, a, in an environment where the editor is the focal point and um, you have absolutely no connection with any other team member, you only go through the editor. And, and that does happen, and there are good reasons for that to happen. Um, you would probably, or I would probably, end up uh, penciling like this. Uh, is that up on the screen? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would go through penciling like this, which, as you can see, is quite a detailed pencil. doesn't matter that it's digital. It doesn't matter that it's it's traditional. I would go for a very detailed pencil um, because I wouldn't know whether somebody else was inking it, how they were inking it. And as a penciler, because I'm creating it from scratch, I'd like to have some influence about the way it finally looks, mm. even over the inkers and the colorers work. I'd like my influence to, to spread into their abilities and into their finishes. Um, so as you can see, when you go to the inks there, there's not a lot in it. It it, it kind of looks very similar to the pencils. There's, there's, there's very few places you can go to uh, to make it look different. Whereas, um, and I don't... <laughs> Don't look at the alternate graphics. It's nothing. <laughs> that's not. There's nothing amazing about that. That's just a, a, a template I've put up. Don't take anything out of that. And then to announcement only. Death no. No, no, <laughs> no announcement at all. I just use a, a, a random template to get my comic book uh, cover sorted. I use the um, alternate template too. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, so there you go. So I've, I've put up a, an insignia on the left hand side and a. Mm. And a and a, a heading for myself so within my penciling for a cover i have to take into account into account graphics and stuff but if you actually look at the way i've penciled this compared to what i just showed you mm -hmm. um you can see this is quite detailed pencil whereas this is far looser uh first off i know i'm going to be inking it myself but it could be a situation where i i'd um i i partnered up with an inker that I trusted uh, and that I knew was going to draw in a certain way. And so I wouldn't need to put as much effort or as much detail into the pencils. So it really depends on your team mechanic and dynamic. Are you doing it yourself? Are you doing it for somebody else? Are you going through an editor? Is your team close knit? Um, I, I would imagine most of the people that will be uh, watching us talking about, about stuff like this, uh, are probably either very small teams or maybe even, you know, one person bands. So um, they would do all the penciling and the ink and the colouring themselves. Um, and uh, I, I think that comes down to practice. Once you get to a point where you're really quite happy with the way that you ink. So for instance here, so if I can pick up my pencils. So once you're really quite happy with the way that you ink and that you're um, convinced that you're you're inking at a, a level where your finishes are are what you want them to be uh, of a certain standard, then you can loosen your pencils up com uh, quite quite a lot. Um, I would still say my pencils probably aren't loose enough here for my own inking, and that's probably my own um, bit of OCD wanting to get it exactly right maybe being still a little scared of the of the uh the inking and the the hardline process at the far end that i just want to make sure i get it so right um but as you can see this is still a lot looser than the example of the of the uh frost giant that that was up just a minute ago and then the lines go over the top and because i'm looking for a particular style of ink a very sort of graphic 
uh, Joe Sinner esque, hopefully uh, inking style, then it, it it makes a difference to how that how that ends up being you know, the finish that you end up on that. So obviously, some people might like to um, have quite a sketchy finish. Some people might like lots of cross hatching in their inking. Um, and and again, it's something that when you do that, you don't need to put every line in uh, on your penciling if you're doing it for yourself or if you have a relationship with an inker that you trust. Mm. Yeah, one thing I notice a big difference in, in that is, um, you know, you're, w- once the ink is in there, you're, you're seeing a whole nother dynamic to storytelling, which is uh, placing the blacks in there yeah. and, and designing the page. And, and yeah. that adds such a huge element to it. And I, I assume you, you kind of planned for that in the penciling, but you just didn't actually. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've seen lots of examples, especially in the book we talk about uh, how to draw the Marvel way, where there seems to be this plan for spotting the inks mm-hmm. and making them work. Um, I think I do it. I, I don't do it overly consciously. I, I, I do check back after I've done my pencils and think where are the best places that, that the larger inks can go. Um, and obviously I play with it when I get to the inking uh, stage. I also look at it and go, oh, no, you know, like it could you it could do some balance there. It could use some balance and uh, it needs a black. It needs a, a level, uh, an area of black to make that panel work. Um, but I'll be honest, I don't think I consciously say, OK, where are my spots when when I'm doing the penciling? Um, mm. But it, it kind of it kind of all comes together. There's no doubt that I do it. It's obvi- it, it's just that I don't I don't you I don't do a staging of it i just uh, it goes in with the process but yes it's it's quite obvious when you look at when you squint at my at the inks of these pages particularly you can see where everything's being uh, balanced as well as it can be so it's obviously something that i do do along the way yeah it's it's interesting um how you learn a lot of things and you know kind of uh, different principles on how to lay out a page and put together a page. But at the same time, it seems like cr- actually creating comics, it's it's kind of like <clears throat> back and forth of intuition versus mm. like intentionality. Um, you do intentionally want to put those blacks in there um, for a lot of different reasons. It has to do with... Uh, guiding the eye it has to do with contrast it has to do with like you said balance um you know but it, it's kind of hard to to have all those things in your mind and say okay now i'm going to work on the contrast now i'm going to work on the flow <laughs> you know it, when when you it's kind of like you look at it at hindsight and you can see okay i did that and that worked out right this this aspect maybe didn't work out as good, you know, Mm -hmm. maybe perhaps you can plan better. Um, I I know for me, I personally don't feel like I'm planning when I'm creating comics as much as maybe I should. I don't know, but it's nice when, when they do turn out the way, you know, I would like them to. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, no, definitely. I mean, for instance, in this cover, um, I, I know that uh, this area, and these areas are going to be block, uh, spot blacks because of the costume. Mm-hmm. So I understand that there's going to be a nice balance going on there and also a lot of depth as well um, so that there'll be a lot of black in there. In here, I'm, I'm considering a black with a, um, with a spatter effect just sort of um, uh, fading out at the bottom before I get to the rocks. And there will be some blacks in here as well, some spot blacks on the on the muscle musculature of uh, of the main demon. Um, so, and, and then in the background, the the buildings will all be line work, uh, simple simple sort of uh, line work. So, um, so you kind of get an idea while you're drawing it. Um, but uh, I certainly don't do an extra stage of spotting blacks. I, I, it just happens. Um, and um, when you get to the inking stage, if you uh, if you feel like something's missing, then you can add it in then, really. Like you say, it's quite intuitive. Yeah, and it's interesting the way you're saying with this page, too, how you're talking about having some blacks in the bottom and then kind of in the mus- musculature in the side there. And you can see how that kind of it, 
doing that, there's like almost like a little swooping effect in that corner and, and it kind of frames the page and then it opens up mm. on the right side with kind of a maybe some lighter colors uh, so that it, it really brings the focal point to your, your um, hero there. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but the blacks in that corner balance with the logo, which is very black and stark. Yeah. So, so there's, there's a lot of interesting things you're doing with the eye there. Yeah, comp composition is hugely important, especially on covers. Um, the, the way that I'm composing this is, <laughs> as I've said many times, this this is based around the Bronze Age kind of feel. So there's lots of action on the cover. I'm probably going to have some speech bubbles on the cover uh, and a couple of extra bits of text. And it's 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 it wants what I want it to look like is I want it to look like the old floppies, mm -hmm. um, but it will be the the front of a graphic novel. Um, and uh and that composition of of how the flow of the demon is is reaching up and uh death is um is coming down and then b below the the background coming through the 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 uh area that i've left um that was a that was from the start uh the, the composition aspect let's see if i can f if i haven't deleted it <clears throat> so i was just playing around with ideas uh, and then there's the there's the sketch. Mm -hmm. it's a bit of, just getting in some windows. Something else I mentioned in the video earlier is uh, yeah. No, I've, I, unfortunately, I've got rid of the original original sketch. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it came from right from the start where I was playing around with shapes and ideas. Um, to try and get the most dynamic feel to the cover, so uh, it, it 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 the the weird thing, like we're saying, we we don't come up with these spots or for for black black spotting or or any of that kind of thing. It, it's so intuitive that you're looking for those things while you're drawing. Maybe I wonder if because um, I, I think that was pretty cool how you were showing some of the more the earlier stages. <clears throat> Maybe you can demonstrate for us like a couple of like, cause when, when we think about penciling, we think about kind of, I, I don't know, maybe we automatically think about the kind of finished pencils that are ready for the inks, but there's more stages to penciling, you know, there's mm. the planning and there's the thumbnails and things like that. Um, maybe you could demonstrate a little bit of, of how you'd plan out maybe that page you were just the, the uh, actual comic cover or something or. Yeah. I've got a page here, page five. Yeah. Um, the, the script being that, um, these, uh, these expectant souls from different parts of existence are waiting to talk to death and tell them about their, their final time in their plane of this existence. And then they're moved on to eternity. Um, and then you get an outside view of, uh, death's palace as it were in the, in the nether realm. Um, and I thought I, I picked out that it would be a, a, a Roman centurion, who'd had something knocked on his head, some alien that, that you couldn't quite understand. And then a, a lady from the, the Bronx or whatever, complaining about a neighbor. Um, and these were the last moments they had before they died and, and moved on to, to, to death to, to give, to give his story. And then death sitting up, this is part of the story. And you're going to see this in the, in the promo soon. Death's bored. He's bored senseless. <laughs> he's fed up of listening to these people. And he's kind of lost his own soul because he's been doing it for so long. Um, he's lost his compassion. He's kind of bored. And, and then so you get a, a flip uh, where you're looking at him being quite sort of dull and going, yeah, yeah, next. And then you look over his shoulder to see them moving through slowly. And then, like I say, you get this outside shot. So that's the the, the rough script. Uh, as best I can remember. Um, so th this is my sketch um, where you can see sort of the, the, the rough characterization. I also probably had, um, I, I also probably had key lines in it. So if we go back a stage, the other thing is I've got a grid. Mm. Okay. So I, I don't want to adhere to the grid so that it becomes boring, mm -hmm. but I do want to have that kind of, again, bronze age kind of grid um so i i put i made myself a grid and put it in again this is easy because it's in digital format mm -hmm. um but you could do this just as easily uh, and print them out and and use them as a grid 
and work off a light box or whatever. It's it's not a problem. Um, so it looks like you got um, maybe a, a a nine panel grid and a and a six panel grid, or is it a twelve panel grid and a six panel? It's, grid? it's all of them. It's, oh, it's everything. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a four, a six, uh, a nine, and a twelve. I think so that I can have any any permeation uh, of those where they where they work out. And then if I want to, I can pick one out, tilt it, pop stuff out, um, and do yeah, what I need to. How you start every page? This like is this is a grid for this particular book. Mm -hmm. um, I don't always have a grid. So, for instance, on the Doctor Who stuff I did, I didn't have any grid at all. Um, the only the only specific thing I had was there is an insignia on the top uh, left hand page of the first page of every strip, so that do you saw a little picture of Doctor Who and it had a little title in it. But other than that, I completely made up all of the uh, layout as I went along. Mm -hmm. um, but because I wanted a particular kind of visual feel to this book uh, and because it's passion project for me, uh, I made a grid for myself and, mm -hmm. and went for the grid. So it's really either or you don't have to do this kind of thing. You can make it up as you go along. There are no hard and fast rules, but if you're going to give yourself some rules, stick to them, mm -hmm. yeah. at least for the most part, so that you can give yourself a, a, a format. If you're going to go crazy and just say, I don't care, every page is going to be completely different and it's all going to be wacky. Fine. Go for it. Um, yeah. But this is this is where I started. But certainly, if you take away the, um, I can't do that. If you take away the the grid aspect, you still want to be able to see your bleed. Uh, you still want to be able to see your a safe area, um, and uh, those kind of things. You, you definitely want to be keeping those in mind. And and again, like I'm saying, you can print this out. Um, uh, you can use it on a light box. I, I would say if you're going to do stuff. Um, traditionally, my personal view is a light box. You need a light box. They're real cheap these days. Um, you, I would do everything on a light box. And in fact, I would suggest that the reason I transferred so easily to to layered work in Photoshop was because that was effectively what I was doing in real life. Mm. I was doing photocopies and sketches and stuff and putting them all together on a light box and then tracing them out the way that I want to do. Um, and when I say tracing, it's tracing my own work. I'm not just tracing other people's stuff. It's it, it, You might do a sketch and you think that sketch is absolutely nailing it, but it's not going to fit in that panel. So you're off to your printer or your scanner or your photocopy shop. You you get a few different sizes of it. You whack it back on your, um, uh, on your light box. You put your paper over the top and you go, all oh, right, that's my sketch. It fits exactly right now. I'm going to repurpose it into there. Or, or you might even cut it out and stick it on your penciling page and then pencil around it. And then when you come to doing your, um, your inks, you can just lay the, the new board over the top and do inks fresh without actually doing them over your pencils. There's all so many different ways of doing it. Um, I, I think if you're, if you're trying to do things um, for as, as best a budget you can, normally I would suggest you will use Bristol board to, to ink pages onto uh, you don't have to go and buy um, pre-printed comic book boards. They're expensive. You don't have to go and do that. Bristol paper is great. And um, you can you can either pencil straight onto that or you can have uh, like a photocopy shop, print shop, print your pencils in blue onto them. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do. And if, if you don't want to go as far as the expense of uh, – using Bristol board, then you can just use cartridge paper um, because, uh, you know, and, and then what you do is maybe not pencil onto the cartridge paper because it's thinner. You can lay that over your pencils on a light box and then ink directly onto the cartridge paper. Um, so there's, there's all ways of doing it. Uh, you won't get a smooth line on cartridge paper. You just won't. But if your style works with it and if the kind of art that you want to produce works with it, then what the hell? It, it really doesn't make any difference. So like I was saying, um, all these things came together, which meant that I'd be more happy working digitally. Um, and in this particular case, I've gone straight for a grid and then used that grid to uh, to decide what I was going to do there. So um, there are my key lines. So I'll, I'll have drawn up some key lines and uh, knocked up a quick sketch. Now, I used to do thumbnails 
uh, like everybody else does. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with thumbnails. They're perfectly good. But because of the way that I work, I don't need to draw a thumbnail and then blow it up and then do my sketch because obviously I'm working at this size anyway. So I, I can... I can do my thumbnail here. This is a thumbnail. Yeah. Uh, and, and all I need to do is just like blow it up and then suddenly it's the right size. So there's another great thing about digital work is you can just zoom in and out mm -hmm. and put as few lines in as you like in order to get your thumbnail working. Mm -hmm. So the upside, obviously, of, of doing traditional thumbnails is that you have lots of them. So you get like of a flow of a story and visually you can see how it's paced. Um, that's just not something I do. I, I just like to go from one page to the next. So there's nothing wrong with it. I can absolutely see the benefit in doing it, but it's just not something that I do. So um, there's my sketch. So um, just, just before you get to the next thing, um, so yeah. you're using uh, Photoshop here, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, just so you guys know, um, you can use Photoshop. You can also use Clip Studio Paint. You can use whatever. Some people are using Krita. Um, I think some people are even making comics in like Procreate and some other programs. Um, and I know one thing, uh, you know, I think basic, the basic thing that really you need in a, in a program is that it has layers. And, and that's what most art application has. Um, one thing I've noticed in Clip Studio Paint that's interesting is I think they do have it, if you buy the, the um, more expensive version, they do have it where, where you can have all your pages kind of mapped right, cool. out or whatever. So it does uh, like a, um, oh, was it a flat plan? Of it for I you. Think so, I think so. Yeah. So um, I, I've never used it yet because I don't have that that version. I'm hoping to get that version because I think that would be beneficial um, for exactly what you're kind of saying here. Uh, but you know, so just wanted to answer the question though: what program you're using? Um, okay. And 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 you know, because I know people will ask. And also, just so you know, whatever you have, make comics on that. You know, don't yeah. don't let anything stop you, even if you don't have computer stuff, you know, do it on paper, whatever. Yeah. Um, when it comes down to it, especially if you plan to print it, all of this stuff is what's called basically pre-production artwork. You know, this this is none of this is the final thing. The printed thing is the final thing. So whatever you need to do to get it so it can be in a format that prints, do that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Def definitely you're absolutely right i i i've started using clip studio mm -hmm. um i just i'm slow to move over i'm an old man it's <laughs> it's taken me time um but i will move over to it because i think it is a cracking piece of software and i think i'll probably do what you're saying is move up to the to the higher uh, version and and that flat plan uh, sounds very good to me actually because wherever i've done it before i've had to make a flat plan at the end of the process anyway to make sure that my page uh, makeup is correct when it goes to print um so uh, it would be a really useful tool so absolutely okay All right so um this this just like a very loose sketch um uh, what are you thinking about when you when you do that first loose sketch i know you know i've done um you know the video where it talks about how to get better at drawing and it just goes through the you know the the gesture the form and then the detail is that kind of the, something you're you're doing here yeah i i think what i'm looking for here is uh the emote aspect of it so um yeah the, the first top left hand corner is where the the centurion is holding his head so i i have to make sure that i've got the right he's holding his head and the guy in the middle is is going what i don't know what's going on and the the the, the older woman is lecturing so she's got her arm across her chair, under her boobs and and she's she's doing this you know um and then uh death is is kind of gesturing he's like oh you know i'm, I'm bored so it's all about emoting and about um gravity about about weight rather than the actual anatomy or mm. getting it specifically right very general proportions and and getting over sort of like the part of the story because you're talking to yourself i'm I'm sitting there read as an artist as a, as a penciler i'm reading the story and putting it down uh i don't really want to be reading the story every time i go back to the page and every pass i do mm. so i'm explaining it to myself for the next stage as well um 
and then uh, once that's down, once that that base is down, then I can then I can go more into the the anatomy and to the scene creation as well, mm. and and bearing the the weight and the structure of what I've tried to get across in the sketch. Um, something I heard a while back, um, and I've never I haven't really heard <clears throat> any other people say this, and it's weird because it seems like it should be said more. But um, I, I, on the old um, what are they called? The the videos that Stanley did with like a lot of the image creators and some other um, creators. One was with Wills Portasio, and uh, Wills. One of the things he brought up was you know on each page he likes to have a, a focal point that kind of for the whole page like one place that's specifically the the most you know obvious area the most focal point. Do you do that prescribe to that or do you? do something different do you try to do that i think i may do that unconsciously mm -hmm. um because often you do have one panel or two panels that really kind of break out from the others as far as what they're doing and maybe more dramatic um certainly uh i i don't know who said it um but but definitely yeah it was probably one of the old guys um definitely I have a rule of trying to get wherever possible at least one panel where there is a full figure. Mm. Um, I didn't actually manage to get it on this particular page, but I was very close. So you, you, again, it's a, it's a rule set. You want to be able to break the rule set where you need to, but it's a really good um, benchmark or, you know, um, sort of rule of thumb as it were to say, you really ought to try and do X. So I think if page four, so for instance, I, I've got pretty much full figures on page four. On page one, I'm close in, but you can see that there's a lot of um, range in distance in that main panel. Um, page seven, I've got some full figures in the top right there and in the bottom left. Um, so you, you can see there's, it's like without making it too rigid and too strict, and you've got to try and get some full figures in from, from that particular rule. And what that helps to do is it actually helps to zoom the camera in and out, making the panels more interesting. So you don't actually have to think as much about, I should zoom the panels in and out as much, because you've got this one rule of thumb that says, right, okay, make sure you've got at least one or two figures in, or at least attempt to get most of the figure in. And by doing that, you're already zooming in and out appropriately to, to give enough drama. That's really interesting. I've never heard that one before, but it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I like to think it does. I, I, I think it's made a difference to my work. There's no doubt about that, where um, where I've, I've made a point of being able to see a full figure on a page, even though it might be a tiny figure, because it, it effectively brings you in and out of the action or in and out of the story. So, Absolutely. Yeah, it's good to have that range, I think, for sure. Um, so um, what about the actual, like, I don't know, I guess the techniques a little bit of um, penciling digitally. The, one, of the re one of the whole reasons why I'm even making this video is selfish. <laughs> but at the same time, I know it can help a lot of other people, too. Um, and that is... Coming up after I'm done with uh, Legend of the Lone Wolf, um, pretty soon I'll be working on penciling uh, for uh, Peter Palmiotti to ink over right. uh, on um, Big Wrath. And I was thinking, you know, he's a traditional guy, you know, but I, I don't think I really want to pencil traditionally for this project because there's a lot of things where I'm going to need to use like perspective tools and stuff. And I, it just, instead of having all kinds of rulers and stuff on my desk, I'd rather just do it digitally. A lot of that stuff can be easier digital. Um, and so anyways, I want, but I, I do want to pencil in a way kind of like you were showing in the beginning where it was more finished so that, you know, he can translate it well and he can understand it and, and right. I want that. Um, and then I want to somehow print that out so he can ink over it. He said he does that all the time. I've never mm -hmm. done that 
process before. Um, but maybe you can get into like, I want them to, I want my pencils to look like traditional pencils so that when he's ready to ink them, it, it's very natural for him. You know what I mean? So I, I think um, if you look at um, how to draw the Marvel way, the video, you'll see John Buscema uh, go through the same stages as he does in the book where he says, you start off with a loose sketch and you just keep going over and tightening it and tightening it and tightening it. And then you rub out the lines that you don't want. And then you ink it over the top. Mm. And that, for all intents and purposes, is a physical manifestation of using layers digitally. Mm. Except the difference is, is every time you go over and sketch it a little bit more, it's another layer. Instead of actually doing it over the pencil work you've, you've currently got. Mm. Um and so in, in reality, there's, there is no difference. It's mm -hmm. just how you approach it um, and how it makes and, and the functionality of it, like control Z. We love that. Yeah. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do to make life easier for you. The dog's not going to eat it. You're not going to spill your coffee on it, all that kind of stuff. No ink pots. Um, outside of that, it's pretty much the same process. Mm -hmm. So um, as far as printing them out is concerned, yeah, you just send him the digital file and he can print them out on the on whatever card he decides he's going to ink it onto. Mm -hmm. That's okay. that's the best way of doing it. I mean, I've done that myself. I do when I do commissions, I do um I can literally sit down and draw on a piece of paper and then ink over the top of it. Mm -hmm. Uh sometimes if I if I've got a particular idea in mind, I might go and digitally pencil it. Um and then what I'll do is I'll do one of two things. I'll either print it out onto a piece of cartridge paper and ink over directly over the top of it, uh, just like normal pencils, mm -hmm. or I'll uh, pencil or I'll print it out dark, put it on a light box, and then put a piece of cartridge over the top or a piece of if they want a particular piece of board, and then ink over that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's multiple ways you can get that done. As for the actual process of drawing. Uh, is pretty much like we were talking about with 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 JB, it, you know, doing it stage by stage, mm -hmm. uh, and um, not being afraid to use layers in in penciling, which is what I do all the time. So, for instance, on on what we've got here, I did this for Draw the Marvel Way. So I started off with a sketch. It's um, Black Widow, Captain America, Captain Marvel, and the Hulk behind. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I went in and did a, a loose sketch. And then put together, um, put together, as you can see, on two layers. I put the the, the anatomy together, the figure work, um, and I also on a separate layer got the Hulk right. This this is um, it's a bit of a bugbear for me because whenever I see comics and somebody's in a pose and say they're looking at you and they've got their their arm behind them like this. Mm -hmm. And I see that their arm is down there or up here. And I'm thinking that person hasn't thought about the anatomy that you can't see. Mm. And, and, and okay, I know that most people won't probably even notice it, but it, it can jar the eye in a subconscious way. Even if you're not noticing it, it can make you look at an image and go, that's not quite right. And as mm. we were saying before, the whole point of a penciler is to drag you in. And even if you're cheating, when I say cheating, even if you're, um expanding reality you know you're you're effectively making stretching things and doing different things with anatomy and and scenes uh, and and physical aspects of 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 the the things that are in your story you still want to drag that that reader in and if an arm is down here when it should be up here because you can't see the bicep because it's behind the rib cage it's going to it's going to mess with your head mm. um and so I have, uh, I probably spend too much time penciling than I should, but I just like to get things right. So, for instance, in this particular case, I drew a full figure Hulk mm -hmm. because I, I wanted to get his legs in the right place when they were behind the figures that were in front of him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It didn't take me long. I, 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 without sounding arrogant, I'm fairly good at anatomy. Um, I, I know my way around the human body, so it, it, it it's not something that I feel takes too much time up at my end. So I'm happy to draw a full figure whenever I need to. Right. And then, it, for instance, what I did in here is to make life a little easier, I then popped a little mask in, a little white mask on the layer. Um, now, what you'd normally have to do is, if you were doing this in 
photocopies traditionally or whatever, you'd have to either cut it out or you'd have to rub something out or put a bit of white mask on. But but it, while you're doing it digitally, um, this is a great way of doing it so that you can see exactly what you've got. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I'll just uh, increase that. There, that's the pencils. So you can, you can see, like, it gets a bit confusing like that. So I just mask it out. Um, and then once that's done, I'm like, I put in a face there, um, just making sure of the background there. And there's the, the guys up at the front and there's Hulk behind. So I've drawn those out and put, as you can see, I've put the mask in. And there I've got my four pencils done. So I, I've messed about with it. I've put a mask in to make sure that I, I, um, I'm not confusing the drawing. Um, but I've still got all the figures in exactly the right place I want. I could now, if I wanted to, I could print that out in uh, blue. So, for instance, if I wanted to, to give someone a blue and I was using Photoshop or, or a similar program, I could... Uh, Overlay or is it lighten? Lighten. There you go. I could do something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And you can print out a blue line for an inker to, to use. So you, you can quite happily, you don't have to draw in blue. Mm -hmm. um, you can just draw uh, in, a, in a pencil. Let's put that all in the same layer. You can do it in a, in a, a normal uh, pencil. I use a VFX brush, uh, which is very pencil-like. It's very nice to draw with. It feels like you're drawing rather than inking. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you can just print that off in blue, and an inker can go over the top of it. Awesome. And what what you've done is you've you've used the power of 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 the digital aspect of what you're doing. Um, which would take you, you, you could do traditionally, it would just take you a bit longer and it would be a, a little bit more faff, but you'd be able to do it, no problem. Uh, yeah. It's just about building layers up and drawing the right thing, using light boxes, photocopies, that kind of stuff. But you've taken your time right the way down by using digital layers. Uh, you're still drawing, it's still art, it's still you, uh, it's still exactly the same thing. Um, but you've used your layers, you've used masks and what have you, cut your time down and created a composition that you really, really like. Uh, and then you can ship it out to an inker mm. or, or Peter, <laughs> <laughs> which, whichever is your 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 preferred ink uh, destination. So, um, yeah, that, that that's kind of the way that I produce them. Um, and you, it, it's still the same process as we looked earlier on with the page. You start with a sketch and you work your way up. Yeah, I like um, I like the way you kind of brought in, uh, you know, what John Busama said and stuff, and and it's just like you said, it's it's layers. You just do a little bit, and then you do a little bit more, and then a little bit more. Take away a little bit, and put a little more, and <laughs> eventually yeah. you come to a place where it looks more on, on the finish side and and ready for an anchor. So, and then I guess even the inking stage really is just an extension of that. If you ink your own work. You do a exactly little more, a little more until you're done yeah. inking. Yeah, I, I mean, with with these, I I had to even though I was inking them myself, I had to be a little bit more detailed because they were going off to an editor. They were going off to an external Marvel editor, so they they went through the production house off to the external Marvel editor, and they had to look at the pencils and go, yes, you, you know, they're right. Uh, I couldn't be any less detailed than this, really. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I, I would have preferred to have been less detailed for. You know, time's sake, but that's not the way it was going to work. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's effectively just it's just another layer over the top of it, another stage. Mm. Um, and then, of course, you can do things once you're there. If you want to add um, depth in your inking without using cross hatching, if you like a, a more graphic style, I, I would suggest that probably mine's a little bit more graphic. It's on the edge there. Um, you can and then do other things like, uh, you know, knock back your inks mm -hmm. so that you get, um, you know, layers as far as depth is concerned. Um, and then that, that could go, I could now send that off to a colorist quite happily. And probably what I'd do is I'd send them one with and without full blacks um, and let them decide which one they'd prefer to use. Gotcha. Cool. But they'd certainly get my intention, even though I didn't talk directly to, uh, James or Freddie, who is the, the colorist on on this book, 
the draw the Marvel way. I, I spoke to him directly after after the the fact. Um, it went through an ed several editors to get to him. He knew that because I'd sent through two options, one with a knockback and one without the knockback, how I kind of envisaged the depth to the to the work, and and he he brought that through uh, into the color work. Mm -hmm. No doubt. Interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess, uh, one thing that's, that's interesting too, that you were, um, kind of mentioning before is, uh, you know, it's funny because penciling, it, it's just weird. Like the roles between the beginning of art to the end of art, you know, the, the penciling to the inking have, have it's funny they haven't always been like obviously defined i guess and sometimes they take on different forms um i've seen you know sometimes people um like i've seen seen like eric larson sometimes he'll do layouts you know for people and and they're not even you know really pencils uh and mm -hmm. then somebody will pencil over that and then somebody will ink over that or um, sometimes people will even ink over something super loose, you know, mm. uh, you know, it, it's more about, and it's just interesting, the different aspects of storytelling. It seems like you tend to, to work a little bit tighter. I, I so far have, when I, when I pencil for myself, I tend to work super loose and I'm really not even drawing until I'm inking, you know? <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. That's what I should be doing. I, I know that, that that I would I would uh, I would get my time my schedules down even even closer, um, mm. but uh, there's just I, I suppose the problem is is that I am by nature a penciler. Mm. I would prefer to do just pencil pages and and leave them to a trusted inker, and that, that would be I would I would adore doing that. Um, but that that's not the real world. It's not going to happen anymore. Those those jobs don't exist anymore. Um, and uh, I think you've got to get out there and do the whole thing is yourself as best you can. If you can find other people to collaborate with, that's great. Um, yeah. But but be prepared to do the whole job. And if you are prepared and you are experienced, you know you, you get yourself some some practice in it, then you know you can get the job done. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And and you know, and it's it is going to be different because. You know, again, I'm going to be working with Peter Palmiotti, and and he, I asked him. He said, "Oh, I could take loose or tight. It's really whatever you want to do." You know, um, but for me, I'm like, when I pencil my stuff, it's almost barely. Even to me, I have a hard time knowing what I even meant. To do. <laughs> it's like it's it's really scratchy. Um, so I can't just send him that, that I, I would feel like <laughs> a hack doing that, but, um, you know, so I definitely want to send him something more on the finished side. Uh, plus I like what you were saying. Like it, it kind of depends on, on what your goal is with your art. You know, are you just looking to get the job done and, or are you maybe not even that, but are you just looking to be the guy who kind of, lays out the page and, and does that part of the storytelling, but you're not, you know, you don't necessarily need your voice to be seen, you know, in any mm. in way, shape or form. But I think you were talking about, you do like that. You want, you know, the anchor to, to be able to translate what you were doing and yeah. have some of yourself in there, you know, Def definitely. Uh, although I, for instance, I've picked up a job recently, which I should be doing in the next six weeks. Oh, which is just layout. So um, it's for a sort of a, a combination, sort of half comic book, half kids book. And it's a, it's a, a Celtic tale. So it has some kind of, it has almost like Lord of the Rings imagery to it. Mm. Um, and uh, the, the illustrator that's going to be doing the, the, the painted end is not... Um, is not versed in the way of storytelling as far as comic books are concerned. Because there is a definite, you know, th there can be some absolutely fabulous illustrators. There can be some fabulous cover artists, but they don't necessarily tell the best story. Mm. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you have to pick the right people with a job. And I've been approached to do just layouts. 
-hmm. So there will be none of me really left because the action will be, you won't be able to see me in the action because yeah. all, all the all the concept work has been done by another illustrator and they'll basically be bringing their skills as a painter and an illustrator mm -hmm. to just lay over the top of what I've done. Um, so I won't be able to be too loose. In fact, what's on the screen right now, which is um, which is the very loose work for my page one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's some more loose work there. Somewhere between that and that, is probably what I'm going to be producing for the, this this particular project, um, and that will be, and I'll be more than happy with that. I'm getting paid. I do the layouts, I send them off, and I probably get a credit in the book, and I'm more than happy with that. But something like this, something of my own, I if I was working with, and when I say something of my own, even if I was drawing a full page of comic strip of Captain America for Marvel, I'd still want me to end up at the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but but to be honest, inking has changed over the past 20, 30 years. It it used to be the case that an inker was an embellisher, mm -hmm. and and they really finished the process off. If you look at Tom Palmer, if you look at um, Joe Sinner, and the way that they inked. In fact, the the run of Fantastic Four uh, through Kirby, through into Boosma, and then onto a whole other bunch of artists, there was such a consistency of look and it was the inca that brought that consistency mm. it was joe sinnott's constant brilliance that yeah. brought that and he can draw himself he's a great artist and he was happy to do that and and a lot of the pencils that came his way in those days especially from from john busimu who was doing lots of different work they were quite loose and he made them all look fantastic um so if if you can work with an inca like that and trust them and know that they'll have a particular look and and that look that that joe Sinner and john busima got it's a total combination of the two of them mm -hmm. you can see both of them in that work if i can do that then i'm more than happy i don't have to take control i just want to make sure that part of me is left in mm -hmm. the end and that an inca hasn't completely um taken themselves you know controlled or taken over the whole look you want a combination of the two uh, yeah. and artwork like that really did it yeah, it's really interesting um, the the role of anchor and and how that has has evolved and and I, I think about Kirby actually specifically um, because he's had a lot of people inking him and um, I think uh, you know I think a lot of people have kind of their favorite anchor over Kirby and mine is the one he he kind of landed on eventually which now I can't I I want to say his name was like Mike Royer or something. I could be wrong. I'm probably no. wrong, <laughs> but uh, basically the thing is, is again, like you're saying, like some anchors would embellish some, some anchors would almost feel like they're fixing, like because mm. Jack Kirby had that crazy, like abstract blocky style. Sometimes the anatomy was all screwed up, but it had that power, you know? Um, and, and I think some inkers might have gone over his work and been like, well, I'm, I'm trying to fix some of these muscles or something, or like, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to soften some of these hard square rectangular type of edges to make it look a little more human. Whereas the inker that he ended up using more often than not, I probably could pull out a comic somewhere here to find out exactly the name, but, um, you know, he he ended up translating it much more, uh, much more like kind of. Um, I'm looking for a specific word. Uh, much more to what Jack Kirby was actually doing, because Jack Kirby was trying to bring forth a specific athletic. It was a more abstract style. It was meant to be a little more, um, kind of blocky and and stuff like that. And that's that's how I love his work to look, and um, you know, his his stuff came through. Actually, here we go. I got, <laughs> I have tons of <laughs> Kirby comics. I just actually Excellent. went through all of my comics, and the one, yeah, it was Mike Royer, um, and the one thing that I didn't take anything out was my Kirby collection, <laughs> and excellent. Um, 
I, I yeah, I, I minimized my comment. I'm gonna have a, actually a video. I, I got rid of a bunch of comics, but yeah, I, I freaking love Kirby so much. But anyways, <laughs> yeah, Mike Royer would would kind of come through and and he would just ink Kirby as Kirby was, um, which again, not saying that that's the way you should do it. Like some there are, like you said, the embellishers, they're great for a reason. And earlier on um, in comic book history, that was a real, like, you would probably think of the inker slash embellisher as the artist almost more than you would think the penciler. The penciler just kind of prepared, mm -hmm. you know, the way, you know, whereas now the penciler or in the, you know, at least when I was growing up in the nineties, the penciler is, is the one who really shone through and, yeah, you know, the king. Yeah. I think of, um, Jim Lee and Scott Williams, you mm. know, or even, um, Wills Portacio and Scott Williams, you know, Scott Williams was, he, he was, he is a very great artist. Like he's really good yeah, at he what he does. And, um, even if he just does his own work, you know, he's really good, but, but, you know, when you saw him ink those different people, you really saw Will Spertasio or you really saw Jim Lee. In that. Oh, without doubt. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, if you look back at um, Kirby's work, his pencils were quite finished. Mm. They, they, there wasn't a lot of room for an inker to move with. Yeah, even um, the backs and stuff, too, yeah. were all filled in. That's right, which is what, which actually, I, as much as we're talking about embellishment, it actually um, underpins the skill of the Incas that were inking him so that you can still see the Inca. Mm -hmm. And and that's, like you say, that's the difference nowadays is is, is so often I see pencilers work and it, it, you might as well just black it up as in, you, you know, change the, the, um, uh, the light and dark on it, the, you know, the, the tones on it and just put it through as it is. Because it, 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 when the inkers go over the top of it, it, it looks, it just looks, uh, you know, more defined and, and nothing else. It, it looks almost identical. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I kind of like the whole idea of of the combination of a penciler and an inker, or at least that the differentiation between the pencil uh, end and the the ink version of it, and how it's grown between the two. Yeah. Um, so even you know, even those inkers that were that were inking Kirby and not changing too much. I mean, Sinner inked Kirby, and it still looks Sinner, like Sinner. It's still Sinner's work. You can see it. But then it's also so desperately, obviously, Kirby. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that kind of um, combination of pencil and inker is, uh, I think, it's true comic art. It's fantastic stuff. Absolutely. Um, so I got a question here from Mario, also known as Marv Artwork here on uh, YouTube. Hi, Marv. <laughs> what's up um his question is a tip for not drawing so much or less when it comes to drawing panels i have the tendency to draw everything that because of my background that's because of my background on illustration uh so do you have any uh i, I guess um yeah do you have any tips on on um kind of how much you should draw in a panel i, I think is kind of what he's yeah, that's tricky. That, that that is tricky. I mean, I've got to a point now where because I've I, I went through as a younger man, I've said this before, I went through lots of different styles, tried lots of different things. I do more cross hatching, I try to be more like Jim Lee. Um, you know, I'd 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 try and uh do all kinds of, of different styles from lots of different people. And and I eventually ended up coming back to th what I felt most comfortable with. Now, it just so happens that the style that I use leaves room for you to be graphical in the way that you portray your work. So some styles would be very much a crosshatch style, uh, very detailed. Some styles extremely realistic as well. And I, I think uh, I'm just I'm just pulling this out of the air. I think it's probably more difficult for them or those styles, should I say, to leave blanks than it is for me to leave blanks in the style that I prefer, which maybe talks to what Marv is, is, is talking about. Because he's an illustrator or because he's a, a more classical illustrator, he's looking to reproduce 
what he sees or reproduce the ideas in his head. Mm -hmm. And that comes with the background. It comes with the whole thing. It's kind of like this whole vision. Um, and uh, it depends what you want to get down on the page in a comic strip perspective. And and does that does that background bring anything to the story? And does it bring anything to the moment in that panel? Mm. So some backgrounds, you, sh you definitely shouldn't ignore backgrounds. They place your characters. They ground your characters. They put them in an environment. They help with what we were talking about earlier about pulling the reader in, making it convincing. But at the same time, it's okay to punctuate that with just using color in the background, no background whatsoever, just using a color to uh, emote, to help to help uh, with emotion, to help with a, a particular scene. So in, in this place, in, in this particular thing here, I've got a whole bundle of people having a massive fight. Um, and I just left the background because I thought, well, there's going to be a red sky. Um, I'm, I'm going for kind of a, a golden age, or, or sorry, a bronze age color scheme. So it'd be nice and bright and what have you. Um, so there's no need to to fill in that with lots of detail. I'll just have like a, a few red gradients in, in the sky. It's going to be a red sky and, and that will do. And then with the, the smaller panels at the bottom, again, there's no need to put background in there because you're focusing on those faces. Um, but when you move on to say this panel, these panels, I want to see space or the weird space that uh, that death's uh, cathedral, whatever it is, is in. And I want to see the environment that that's in. And then down the bottom here, I've got an extremely detailed uh, uh, exposition, as it were, of the inside of the of of his um, his cathedral, whatever it is. So it, it's all about swing. It's all about horses for courses. It's like what what does your panel require? Mm -hmm. What does that portion of the story require? Does it really need the background or does it not? Um, and again, here, I mean, technically, you know, these guys at the top should all have background behind them. Mm -hmm. But I felt that in these particular cases, I'm focusing on the particular emotions of these these three individuals, what they're blabbing on about to, to, to death about. Um, there's no need to get confused. So with what's going on in the background. So I think it's a combination of things. Look at your story, look at the moment you're trying to portray in your panel and look at whether the background is going to help that or not, or whether it's going to look weird if it's not there. If you can get away with not putting a background in on a closer moment, I would suggest do it because it, it's, it, it's making it, it's clarifying the moment, it's clarifying the panel. But as soon as you pull out, and you start putting people or putting your characters in an environment. So, for instance, I'm looking over the shoulder of death here in the fourth panel, and I'm looking down onto the floor, and the, there are characters in front. I need to say, well, there's a floor there and a wall, and it needs to be the same as the floor and the wall that was that I showed in the previous panel. So it's, it's all about putting your characters in a setting and um, the story that's going on around them at that moment in time. Hopefully that's helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And one thing I think about, too, is, um, you know, there's different tendencies. Um, some people avoid backgrounds. I'm probably more as you start off, you know, you have these tendencies. I'm probably more of the avoider of a background. Um, but then there's some people who, um, you know, they feel maybe i mean everybody's got different motivations but like may sometimes i wonder like they feel like they're being lazy if they don't put a background mm -hmm. or you know but the thing is is you know it really again it's all about storytelling it really mm -hmm. depends um you do need to have backgrounds or else you're just gonna i mean i look at some of you know Rob Liefeld's recent work, um, and and even in the past, but like I was looking at uh, that Major X comic a while back, and you know that 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 first book was just filled with with characters floating like all <laughs> over the place. Like I didn't know where they were at any given point. So many times, you know, there was no sense of environment that really kept me you know in a in a place and and so that took me out of the story it made it not mm -hmm. work so well for me um that being said there are people who who almost in an ocd way put you know <laughs> backgrounds in every single panel yeah 
becomes too busy and you know your eye needs a place to rest like in this panel right here that you're showing like my eye automatically goes up to the top there and you can see like obviously there's this big like war going on but at the top you can really see that action too so it, it's kind of accentuating um the the energy and power of what's going on and um, it also is framing up those those figures in the background, but also the focal point is kind of in the front where you have a lot of um, you can even even though this is a panel of just tons of figures and not really much else, you have a foreground, a midground, and a background. Yeah. You know, there's depth there. You know, and if you if you put like buildings behind those people who are in the background, you know, that would have taken something away, I think, from that panel, you know. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And and that's the idea behind it is if you put mountains or whatever clouds it with, with key lines before you put your colors in, it's just gonna mess things up. It's it's just gonna take away the focus. And and you're right, there's you've got like this horizon and and uh a silhouette line almost around all the figures that are up in the air. It's almost like everything's been thrown up in the air. And, mm. and, and if you had a background behind that key line background, it would take it away. It cuts start getting confusing. So yeah, it's, it's picking your moments. Um, I was just going to pick a book off the shelf. Great question, Mario, by the way, that's, yeah. really, I think a lot of people will get something from that and hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> if you look at something like Watchmen, Mm -hmm. and every panel that there aren't any cutouts in this every panel has a background of one sort or another i'd say 90 percent. but there are places where there is no background like i say it's only 90 percent, but there are a few and they really work and normally they're close in mm -hmm. so for instance in this panel it's the first one I could find off the top of my head. And these panels. Oh, hold on. Let me see if I can uh, yeah, there you go. it over to you. Yep. So those panels on the left, mm -hmm. there's no background. He's got the he's got the table, but there's it's a flat color background. Yeah. Gotcha. There's no and it focuses on the character. Whereas here, more than happy to put lots of background in these things. But they're very, very simple. They've, they've not gone over the top. And it, uh, obviously, the, as well, the, the classic of this is a, it's a nine-panel grid, um, which is hard to work with. Um, but it, it just goes to show that it's about, you know, the, the art in this, there's backgrounds in pretty much most of it because it works. And then when it doesn't work, the background is removed. Mm -hmm. So it's very much a case of what works for the story not just fill everything no it's not a, it's not an art rule backgrounds in panels are not an art rule they're a story rule yeah they're a tool, they're a tool you know yeah so so it's like don't put the background in because i must because the artist mu must put it in you put the backgrounds in because they work when you're telling the story in that panel at that moment mm -hmm. yeah i think of um you know, manga too. I really, the, it's it's so interesting the range of backgrounds with <laughs> any action manga. Um, I mean, the amazing backgrounds I've seen <laughs> in manga with crazy detail. But yeah. at the same time, sometimes there's page after page after page with no background whatsoever. No, and that no. is so huge. You know, <laughs> I mean, how many times have we seen a Jim Lee comic? or a Rob Liefeld comic as well, in all yeah. fairness, or a Kirkman comic, uh, where there were just lines in the background, mm -hmm. like speed lines right the way across. So you have a figure, and there was just like speed lines, and they put a gradient of color in there because back in the 90s we were still using dodgy color techniques in, in comics, and it just that would be it. And it's like, well, that's not a background, is it? But it, but it, but it was because it worked. Yeah, It worked in the story moment. It gave you an impression of speed or of energy. It's a comic. Comic books are ethereal. They're not. Uh, they're not uh, explicit. They're ethereal. 
They're, they're there to tell you a story. They're there to make you feel. They're, they're there to uh, get an, a reaction from you and, and make and draw you in. They're not there to show you a photo real, a realistic world. Mm. If you want photo real, realistic, go and watch a film. Yeah, there are great films, um, and you want to marvel at the cinematography. Um, but you you don't you, you don't you don't come to comics to get a a, a photo realistic representation of the world i mean that's in some ways it's a little bit um off topic what i'm about to say but um you know to to your point you know before we were doing this video we were chatting about that exact thing and you know i just recently picked up almost by accident where where did i put it (laughs) (laughs) i put it down somewhere it's down uh, it's gone down the hole yeah, I just recently picked up this. I don't know why X Men number one. It's a new, a new beginning. I guess I don't. I don't know. They're doing like this whole new storyline. I don't even know what caused me to want to buy this, but I did, and I just read it. And you know, it's very much you could tell. Like in some ways, it's almost a storyboard to a certain degree. Um, it's, it's not that bad. Like there's definitely comics that are more like, yeah, this was meant to just be like a a pitch for a movie. That's not quite what this is, but there are comics like that. And, you know, I feel like it loses something, you know, it's, it's nice that it has a cinematic feel, but at the same time, it's like, it loses the comic bookiness and there's something to that comic bookiness. You know, there's some, there's, a lot of things you can do in comic books that you can't do in any other medium. Every medium is like that. There's things you can do um, that you can't do in another medium. And comics are awesome in and of themselves. You know, they just really are. And that's why, you know, when, when they adapt a comic book into a movie, you know, the costumes change, things look different because if you put them exactly how they are in the comics, they would just look really weird. (laughs) (laughs) Makes sense. Um, you're right. <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I just thought of an example, for instance. So, for instance, um, you know, a writer can say the, the the hero walks over the top of the brow of a hill and on the other side sees a, a, fifth, a, 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 a one million strong army of orcs. That's really easy to write. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's, it's it's a lot harder to draw <laughs> and it's a lot harder to put in a movie as well mm. so you know bigger budgets but but easier to do in a comic but they're stuck they're both still really difficult to do mm-hmm. but what what films can't do is the writer can say uh and and our hero has leapt into the air and is coming down with a with a forceful strike and what you do in the comic page is do a cutout so there's no background. It's just the figure, and you've popped the figure out, and it pops across the, the uh, a panel at top, and it cro- pops across a panel at the bottom. Yeah. You can't get that visual energy from a film, yeah, because you just can't do that. There's lots of other techniques you can do, which are probably equal, but that particular one you cannot do. So there's always a difference between comics and and film and the way that they portray. Um, stories and the way that they show stories. Now, I've I've got lots of modern comics and and old comics sitting above me, and there are several from probably not from the last five or six years. I've been buying that many, but certainly uh, if I go back and I look at something like Fear itself, for instance, from Marvel, I thought the artwork in that was fantastic. Um, the the story was a very somber tone. It very much felt like a movie it very much felt like an MCU movie without the jokes, to be honest. Uh, it wasn't as lightweight as a, as a, as a movie. And I, we mentioned earlier, I, I, I think there's this differentiation between comics, uh, the way that comics are done, uh, like the way they were done bronze age and, and in the nineties and the way that mainstream comics are now. And they, it's not so much the, um, pulling heroes apart the de- deconstruction of batman or the deconstruction of, of of superheroes via watchmen it's not so much that it's just a sort of a generally darker more adult tone in so many of the stories in mainstream comics that 
the the old Bronze Age and 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 even some of uh, some of the ninety stuff just didn't have. It was far more fun. So, for instance, I can I can give an example of that in the movies as the first Captain America was was pure Bronze Age to me. They did it really well. Obviously, they had to change costumes, special effects, filmmaking, writing for a general audience. They did all that kind of stuff, but it was still pop fun, you know. And then, um, then they did uh, uh, Winter Soldier, which I absolutely adore. I think it's a fantastic uh, film, but yeah. that was Bronze Age. That was like somber and serious. And like I say, I can enjoy both types. Like I can enjoy both types of comics. But that I think that's a, a reasonable example of the two different approaches. And what I fear is that most mainstream comics these days are simply done as pamphlets or approaches to find some way of getting into TV and movies mm. instead of just making comics. Um, and to suggest that there's no market for comics is rubbish. There's still a market for comics. People still like a visual medium in their hand. And, and to have that book and to enjoy it and to pick it off the shelf again. Even young people still, you know, with their iPads and iPhones and those crazy young'uns, um, even it's it's everybody. There's a market for it everywhere. And if you lose the fun stuff and just focus on this somber cinematic world, even in a comic book, you'll, I agree with you 100%, you're losing something. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, don't, don't, don't go so far one way that it, it removes all the others. And like you say, we, we said this earlier, well, there's still people like us around and like the, the great people in the group and in Discord server and, and so many people on YouTube and out in there in the fandom. Um, well, there's still people like us around. There'll still be fun comics. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah, I, th I, I totally agree. And I, you know, I think there's room for all the mediums and I think that, uh, you know, comic books are just, they're really awesome. And and one thing that people don't um, realize, I had a conversation recently about this is, you know, comics are just stories and we all love stories. You know, it, it just happens that they have been marketed to very small demographics of uh, people in America. You know, that's not the case in every country. Um, so there's there's no reason why people can't be into comics and you know just because everybody's doing the grimy gritty on the the big screen and even in comics hey that just makes more again it's like that negative mm -hmm. space in the comic you know that leaves room for people like us to do the things we like to do you know and so there can be both things um, so anyways with all that said um, thank you so much for um, hanging out with us and talking about penciling and, and really letting us pick your brain. Cause uh, I think, I think we really covered a lot of cool stuff here. That's uh, no problem. Anytime. Absolutely. And where can people find you once again, Russ? Yeah, they can get me on russleach.com only death can save us.com. That's my new book that we've been looking at the pages here. Um, comic book, black belt.com. Obviously the, the, the video channel, YouTube channel, comic book, black belt, uh, over on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And uh, also I have a, a link for my uh, email subscription list over on all those places. Just click the link. Yeah. And those links are also right in the description below, even as we speak. Yeah. Um, so definitely check those out. Uh, and you know where to find me, uh, donkeyjawprojects.com and Marsh Comics on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. <laughs> and... Uh, other than that, thank you, everybody, for watching. Hopefully you got something from this. If you have any other questions, feel free to leave them in the comments, and we will talk to you on the next one. See you. Later, guys.